Chapter Fifteen of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. A new profession. It was not until my signed contract to speak for forty-nine consecutive days in forty-nine different places was laid before me that I realized I had agreed to do what I did not know how to do. I had never in my life stood on my feet and made a professional speech. To begin with could i make people hear i felt convinced that i had something to say and so did my sponsors but to what good if i could not be heard what was this thing they called placing the voice i went to my friend franklin sargent of the american academy of dramatic arts told him of my predicament after a first test he agreed with me that i did not know how to use my voice and that unless i could learn i was letting myself in for a bad failure mr sargent was good enough to take me on as a pupil uninteresting a one as i must have been he began by putting me on the simplest exercises but with severe instructions about keeping them up i went about my apartment day and night shouting ma me mi mo ba be bi bo i learned that the voice must come from the diaphragm and that the diaphragm must be strong to throw it out for an hour at a time regularly every morning and every night lying on my back with books on my stomach i breathed deeply until i could lift four or five volumes by the time the circuit opened in july i knew theoretically how to use my voice but i soon found that to do it without now and then getting it into my throat making horrible noises and throwing myself into nervous panics i must be more conscious of it than was good for my method of handling my material indeed it was not until my second year of speaking that i could count on my voice for the hour of the performance i never came to a point where i did not have to ask that a glass of water be put within reach just in case i found a glass of water a safety device if my attention was distracted for a moment and i lost my line of argument i could pick it up pretend to drink change my position regain poise so much for my voice i knew how to make people hear what i was saying now as to material i was to talk on the same subject day after day that is i was supposed to make daily the same speech i was afraid of a memorized speech a lecture experience of my old friend george kennan was largely responsible for that after he had published his classic work on siberia mr kennan took his story to the lecture platform he wrote his lecture with characteristic care memorized it and repeated it night after night on the long tours he made it was an admirable lecture one of the most moving i ever heard in telling me of his platform experiences, Mr. Kennan dropped this warning. In giving a memorized lecture, one must be very careful that no two sentences end with the same word. In my lecture on Siberia, I unwittingly used five or six identical words to end different sentences, one near the opening, the other near the closing of my talk one night when perhaps i was unusually tired instead of picking up what followed the first sentence i picked up the words that followed the second that is i was ending my lecture when i had only just begun it i saved myself but after that i always took care that there were no two sentences in my talk with identical even similar endings my memory is a tricky and unreliable organ never properly trained never held resolutely to its job i should have been afraid to trust it on a lecture platform moreover i realized that since i was no orator and never should be my only hope was to give the appearance of talking naturally spontaneously i put together what seemed to me a logical framework and decided to drape it afresh every day never to begin with the same words to use fresh illustrations to think aloud experimenting i soon discovered a fresh beginning every day was too much to ask of myself under the conditions of travel i found it foolish too for if i had struck an opening that arrested attention why change it for one that might not i soon found that illustrations which were all right in an article did not serve with an audience 
the line of argument which i would have followed in an article became more effective on a platform if switched that is as it turned out although i was giving the same lecture every day it was never quite the same i worked on it constantly and that is what kept my interest i think because always i found however tired i might be however much i despised myself for undertaking to do what i more and more realized i did not know how to do i always was interested in my subject talking as if it was something of which i had never talked before it was that personal interest in my material which carried me through i had not given a thought in advance to the physical aspect of my undertaking i had known that every day for forty-nine days i was to speak in a different place i knew that meant daily travelling but that had not disturbed me i had always prided myself that i was superior to physical surroundings i had not been long on the chautauqua circuit before i was realizing that they played an enormous part in my day i found i was inquiring about the town to which we were headed how about the hotel are there bathrooms if so am i to get one i was uneasy about the table the ideas of cooking and serving and at night about the noises the draughts and other unmentionable worries to my amazement the bed in which i was to sleep soon was taking an altogether disproportionate place in my mind it is a fact that when the circuit was over and i came to tell its story i could draw a diagram of any one of the rooms in which i had slept giving the exact location of the bed in relation to windows and doors and bathroom i remembered these beds when i did not remember the hotel to my surprise i found myself deeply interested in the physical life of the circuit so like the life of the circus we performed in tents and our outfit was as gay as ever you saw khaki tents bound in red with a great khaki fence about pennants floating up and down the streets and within order cleanliness and the smartest kind of little platform and side dressing rooms naturally i had no little curiosity about my travelling companions scoffing eastern friends told me that there would be bell ringers trained dogs and tyrolese yodlers i found no such entertainment but i could hardly have fallen in with pleasanter company a quintet of young people whose business it was to sing for three-quarters of an hour before my afternoon lecture and for a like period before the evening entertainment proved to be the gayest kindest healthiest of companions they were hard workers seriously interested in pleasing their audiences they knew not only how to work but how to live on the kind of junket that i had undertaken in other words here was a group of five young people who were doing what to me was very unusual in a thoroughly professional way the seventh member of our party the evening entertainer sidney landon had had long experience on the circuit he was doing his work exactly as a good writer or a good lawyer would do his i saw at once that what i had joined was not as i had hastily imagined a haphazard semi-business semi-philanthropic happy-go-lucky new kind of barnstorming it was serious work in starting the chautauqua work i was not conscious that there was a large percentage of condescension in my attitude my first audience revealed my mind to me with painful definiteness and humbled me beyond expression it was all so unlike anything that i had had in my mind i was to speak in the evening and arrived at my destination late and after a rather hard day it was a steel town one which i had known long years before the picturesqueness of the thing struck me with amazement planted on an open space in the straggling dimly lighted streets where the heavy panting of the blast furnaces could be clearly heard i saw the tent ablaze with electric lights for if you please we carried our own electric equipment from all directions men women and children were flocking white shirtwaists in profusion few coats and still fewer hats and there were so many of them i felt a queer sensation of alarm here in the high banked tiers were scores upon scores of serious faces of hard-working men 
i had come to talk about the hopeful and optimistic things that i had seen in the industrial life of the country but face to face with these men within sound of the heavy panting of great furnaces within sight of the unpainted undrained rows of company houses which i had noticed as i came in on the train the memory of many a long and bitter labor struggle that i had known of in that valley came to life and all my pretty tales seemed now terribly flimsy they were so serious and they listened so intently to get something and the tragedy was that i had not more to give them this was my first audience i never had another that made so deep an impression upon me i had not been long on the circuit before i realized that my audience had only a languid interest in my subject that what they were really interested in wanted to hear and talk about was the war then ending its second year but i could not talk about the war nothing had ever so engulfed me as in a black fog closed my mouth confused my mind chiefly this was because of the apparent collapse of organized efforts to persuade or to force peaceful settlements of international quarrels these had taken so large a place in the thinking and agitating of the liberal-minded with whom i lived that i had begun to delude myself that they were actually strong enough to prevent future wars largely these efforts were the result of the revulsion the conflicts of the nineties had caused the boer war the greco-turkish war the spanish war people who wanted to live in peace wrote books talked organized societies national and international jane adams stirred the english-speaking world by her newer ideals of peace william h taft elihu root leading public men educators combined in one or another society advocating this or that form of machinery and while this was going on theodore roosevelt was doing his best to counteract it by his bold talk of war as a maker of men the only adequate machine for preparing human beings for the beneficent strenuous life he advocated what was the american magazine to do about it it seemed to us that we ought to find some answer to theodore roosevelt certainly we could not do it by promoting organized efforts certainly not by preaching we must prove him wrong in nineteen ten our attention was turned to what seemed a possibly useful educational effort against war inaugurated at stanford university by its president david starr jordan i knew dr jordan slightly his argument for opening the channels of world trade in the interest of peace had helped keep my spirits when laboring against the tariff lobbies that so effectively closed them what were they doing in stanford it was decided that i go out and see at least there might be material for an article or two early in nineteen eleven dr jordan arranged that i spend a few weeks at the university he was very cordial meeting me at los angeles where i arrived low in mind and body from an attack of influenza there was to be a peace meeting that night dr jordan was to speak they had announced me and when i refused to get out of my bed they took it as proof of indifference to the cause the truth was that the idea of speaking extemporaneously was at that time terrifying to me ill too i could not or perhaps would not rally my forces i would rather be regarded as a sneak than attempt it but dr jordan understood and laughed off my apology and together we made a leisurely trip to palo alto he was a delightful companion when he felt like talking as he often did there was nothing which did not interest him looking out of the car window he talked not of peace at all but of birds and trees and fishes and roosevelt and the recent earthquake at palo alto i found the most exciting course then offered to the students was the six weeks on war and peace which i had come to study the big assembly room was packed for all the public lectures among the advanced students following the course were several who have since made names for themselves bruce blyven robert l duffus maxwell anderson there was considerable intensive work on special themes 
one student was collecting war slogans another making a comparison of declarations of war each of which called god to witness that its cause was just another student was compiling tables showing yearly increase in the costs of armament in the twenty years from eighteen ninety on another the economic losses through the devastations caused by war and so on all interesting and useful material but study the work as closely as i could i could not for the life of me lay my hands on that definite something which the american needed finally i took my discouragement to dr jordan and together we planned collaboration on a series of articles to be called the case against war dr jordan in his autobiography the days of a man tells of our scheme and what became of it crowding events permitted war to frame its own case in august nineteen fourteen all of the machinery on which peace lovers had counted collapsed the socialists in a body in every country took up arms so did organized labor so did the professional advocates of peace it was not only this collapse of effort that had stunned me from the hour war was declared i had a sense of doom quite inexplicable in so matter-of-fact a person we should go in of that i felt certain after we did go in john siddle more than once recalled how in the august of nineteen fourteen when a party of us were dining at the then popular hungarian restaurant on houston street i had said that before the thing was ended the united states the world would be in you are a prophet siddle would laugh but i was not a prophet it was the logic of my conviction that the world is one that isolation of nations is as fantastic as isolation of the earth from the solar system the solar system from the universe all this made a species of fabian pacifist of me i was for anything that looked to peace to neutrality but it was always with the hopeless feeling that one simply must do what one can if the house is on fire i could not share the hate of germany in spite of my profound devotion to france my conviction that germany had believed a war of conquest essential to realize what she called her destiny that she had been consciously preparing for it that she thought the day had come when she could venture it the awful thing seemed too big for hate by puny humans and i was amazed and no little shocked soon after the outbreak when visiting my friend john burroughs at squirrel lodge in the catskills i found him whom i had always regarded as an apostle of peace and light in a continuous angry fever against all things german woodchucks were troubling his corn and every morning he went out with his gun another damned hun he would cry savagely when he returned with his dead game time did not cure john burroughs wrath for in december nineteen seventeen he pledged himself in an open letter published in the new york tribune never to read a german book never to buy an article of german make but john burroughs was not the only one of my supposedly gentle-souled friends who felt this serious necessity to punish not only now but forever i was too befogged to hate or to take part in the organizations looking to ending the war which sprang up all about and which i felt so despairingly were all futile there was mr ford's peace ship mr ford had startled me one day in the spring of nineteen fifteen when in detroit i was observing his methods for making men by saying suddenly you know i am rather coming to the conclusion that we ought to join the allies if we go in we can finish the thing quickly and that is what should be done as it is now they will fight to a finish it ought some way to be stopped and i see no other way six months later mr ford called me up at my home in new york and asked if i would not come to his hotel he and miss adams wanted to talk with me of course i went at once it is curious how sometimes when one steps inside a door without knowing what is behind it one senses caution the door was open to mr ford's suite nobody in sight no answer to my ring but i could hear voices and followed them to a room at the end of the hall mr ford was standing in the corner facing me before him were two rows of men 
reporters i knew here boys is miss tarbell she will go with us he called go where mr ford i asked oh he said we are chartering a peace ship we are going to europe and get the boys out of the trenches by christmas i had a terrible sinking of heart oh mr ford i don't think i could go on such an expedition come with me and we will convince you and he led me into a room where madame rosica schwimmer and my old friend fred howe were talking jane adams was not there tell miss tarbell what we are going to do we want her to go along and he went back to the reporters i put in one of the most difficult hours of my life madame schwimmer argued ably so did mr howe and all i could say was feeling like a poor worm as i said it i can't see it when mr ford came back and they told him she can't see it i tried to explain my doubts he listened intently and then very gently said don't bother her she'll come on top of this interview came a long telegram followed by a longer letter both signed by henry ford i doubt now if he ever saw either of them certainly the signature at the foot of the letter is not his i am putting them in here long as they are because they are important in the history of the peace ship and so far as i know have never been printed here they are november twenty fourth nineteen fifteen will you come as my guest aboard the oscar second of the scandinavian american line sailing from new york december fourth for christiania stockholm and copenhagen i am cabling leading men and women of the european nations to join us en route and at some central point to be determined later establish an international conference dedicated to negotiations leading to a just settlement of the war a hundred representative americans are being invited among whom jane adams thomas a edison and john wanamaker have accepted to-day full letter follows with twenty thousand men killed every twenty-four hours tens of thousands maimed homes ruined another winter begun the time has come for a few men and women with courage and energy irrespective of the cost in personal inconvenience money sacrifice and criticism to free the good will of europe that it may assert itself for peace and justice with the strong probability that international disarmament can be accomplished please wire reply november twenty seventh nineteen fifteen dear miss tarbell from the moment i realize that the world situation demands immediate action if we do not want the war fire to spread any further i join these international forces which are working toward ending this unparalleled catastrophe this i realize is my human duty there is full evidence that the carnage which already has cost ten millions of lives can and is expected to be stopped through the agency of a mediating conference of the six disinterested european nations holland denmark sweden norway switzerland spain and the united states envoys to thirteen belligerent and neutral european governments have ascertained in forty visits that there is a universal peace desire this peace desire for the sake of diplomatic etiquette never can be expressed openly or publicly until one side or the other is definitely defeated or until both sides are entirely exhausted for fifteen months the people of the world have waited for the governments to act have waited for governments to lead europe out of its unspeakable agony and suffering and to prevent europe's entire destruction as european neutral governments are unable to act without the cooperation of our government and as our government for unknown reasons has not offered this cooperation no further time can be wasted in waiting for governmental action in order that their sacrifice may not have been in vain humanity owes it to the millions of men led like cattle to the slaughter-house that a supreme effort be made to stop this wicked waste of life the people of the belligerent countries did not want the war the people did not make it the people want peace it is their human right to get a chance to make it the world looks to us to america to lead in ideals 
the greatest mission ever before a nation is ours that is why i appealed to you as a representative of american democracy in my telegram of the twenty fourth it is for the same reason that i repeat my appeal to you and urge you to join a peace pilgrimage men and women of our country representing all of its ideals and all of its activities will start from new york on the fourth of december aboard the scandinavian american steamship oscar the second the peace ship that carries the american delegation will proceed to christiania where norway's valiant sons and daughters will join the crusade in stockholm the ship's company will be reinforced by the choicest of sweden's democracy the crusade will then go on to copenhagen where further harbingers of peace will be foregathered these various groups will add such momentum to the crusade that when the pilgrims reach the hague with its achievements of international justice and comity the moral power of the peace movement will be irresistible in the hague we hope to meet delegations from switzerland and from spain from all these various delegations will be selected a small deliberative body which shall sit in one of the neutral capitals here it will be joined by a limited number of authorities of international promise from each belligerent country this international conference will frame terms of peace based on justice for all regardless of the military situation this international conference will be an agency for continuous mediation it will be dedicated to the stoppage of this hideous international carnage and further dedicated to the prevention of future wars through the abolition of competitive armaments in case of a governmental call for an official neutral conference before the peace ship departs from new york or even reaches european shores our party will continue on its mission rejoicing that the official gathering has materialized we will then place our united strength solidly behind those entrusted by the governments to carry on the peace negotiations in the hague the members of the peace pilgrimage will dissolve accommodations will be provided for each one back to his home it is impossible to determine the exact length of time the pilgrimage will take six weeks however should be allowed i respectfully beg of you to respond to the call of humanity and join the consecrated spirits who have already signified a desire to help make history in a new way the people of europe cry out to you information about the meeting place in new york the hour of sailing the amount of luggage your accommodations etc will be sent as soon as we have your reply i should appreciate it if you would telegraph your affirmative decision will you send it to the hotel biltmore suite seven seventeen new york our temporary headquarters yours for peace henry ford i have no copies of my replies but i know the gist of them must have been a heavy-hearted i can't do it mr ford the night after my visit to the hotel miss adams called me up and for a half hour we argued the matter on the telephone all i could say was if you see it you must go miss adams i don't see it and i can't it is possible that standing on the street corner and crying peace peace may do good i do not say that it will not but i cannot see it for myself we were to talk it over in the morning but that night they took her to chicago hurried her into a hospital she was very ill jane adams did not go on the peace ship years after i asked her would you have gone if you had not been ill i certainly should she said there was a chance and i was for taking every chance she always took every chance when it was a matter of human relief and if she had gone things would have been different on the peace ship for she and not madame schwimmer would have been in command she saw quite clearly the managerial tendencies of madame schwimmer but she also saw her abilities she was not willing because of doubts to throw over a chance to strengthen the demand for peace and she undoubtedly trusted to her own long experience in handling people to handle madame schwimmer but she did not go it was a tragedy of hasty action of attempting a great end without proper preparation 
mr ford would never have attempted to build a new type of automobile engine as he attempted to handle the most powerful thing in the world the unbridled passions of men organized to come to a conclusion by killing one another the peace ship was a failure but so were the undercover official efforts the president and his sympathizers then steadily pushed things grew blacker the day when we would go in seemed always nearer to me in february of nineteen sixteen my depression was deepened by hearing mr wilson himself admit it my friend secretary and mrs daniels had been so gracious as to include me among their guests at the cabinet dinner they were giving in honor of the president and the new mrs wilson we were all standing in the daniels drawing-room waiting their arrival i was talking so interestedly with somebody that i had forgotten what it was all about when i was conscious of a distinguished pair in the doorway it took me an instant to remember what we were there for and that this was the president and his lady how they looked the part at the dinner-table the president was gay telling stories quoting limericks later when it came my turn to talk to him and i told him how charming i had found mrs wilson's animation and lively wit he rather eagerly fell to talking of her and to my amazed delight of the difficulties of courting a lady when each time he calls the house is surrounded by secret service men dropping his gaiety he told me a little of the situation at the moment i never go to bed without realizing that i may be called up by news that will mean we are at war before tomorrow morning we may be at war it is harder because the reports that come to us must be kept secret hasty action indiscretion might plunge us into a dangerous situation when a little care would entirely change the face of things my great duty is not to see red i carried away from that dinner a feeling of the tremendous difficulty of the tremendous threat under which we lived and of a man that had steeled himself to see us through it strengthened my confidence in him but of all of this i could say nothing on my chautauqua circuit even when i began to realize that more than anything else these people were interested in the war one of the most convincing proofs i received of this came from things i overheard at night we ended our circuit with a siege of terrific heat the kind of heat that made sleep impossible the best room you could get was generally on the second floor front you pulled your bed to the window and lay with your head practically out but if you could not sleep you would certainly be entertained for on the sidewalks below there would gather around nine thirty or ten a little group of citizens who had come downtown after supper to see a man shopkeepers laborers traveling men lawyers and occasional preachers and hotel keepers would sit out talking war preparedness neutrality wilson hughes for half the night look at them said a talkative congressional candidate four years ago i could have told how practically every one of the men in this town would vote in november i can't do it to-day nobody can they are freed from partisanship as i could never have believed they are out there now thrashing over wilson and hughes and not twenty-five per cent of them know which it will be when election day comes more and more i came to feel that you could count on these people for any effort or sacrifice that they believed necessary one of the most revealing things about a country is the way it takes the threat of war just after we started the call for troops for mexico came it seemed as if war were inevitable there was no undue excitement where we traveled but boys in khaki seemed to spring out of the ground i shall never forget one scene which was being duplicated in many places in that region we were in an old mountain town in pennsylvania our hotel was on the public square a small plot encircled by a row of dignified old-fashioned buildings in the center stood a bandstand and beside it a foolish little stone soldier mounted on an overhigh pedestal a civil war monument we were told that on the square at half-past nine in the evening a town meeting would be called to say good-bye to the boys who were off to mexico on the ten thirty how many of them i asked one hundred and thirty-five was the answer 
and this was a town of not over twenty eight hundred people as the hour approached the whole town gathered it came quietly as if for some natural weekly meeting but a little before ten o'clock we heard the drum and fife and down the street came a procession that set my heart thumping close behind the city fathers and speakers came a dozen old soldiers some of them in faded blue two or three on crutches and behind them the boys one hundred and thirty-five of them sober consciously erect their eyes straight ahead their steps so full of youth the procession formed before the little stone soldier who somehow suddenly became anything but foolish he took on dignity and power as had the boys in rank boys whom if i had seen them the day before i might have called unthinking shiftless unreliable the mayor the ministers a former congressman all talked there was a prayer the crowd in solemn tones sang my country tis of thee there was a curt order the procession reformed the old soldiers led the way and the town followed the boys to the ten thirty nothing could have equalled the impression made by the quietness and the naturalness of the proceedings beside the continuous agitations and hysteria to which the east had treated us in the last two and a half years this dignity this immediate action this willingness to see it through gave one a solemn sense of the power and trustworthiness of this people it was a realization that i should have been willing to pay almost any price to come to certainly it more than paid me for my forty-nine nights in forty-nine different beds eight months later this impression of the steadiness of the people under the threat of war deepened after my chautauqua circuit which i had supposed to be a temporary adventure the lecture bureau asked to book me for a month of lyceum work most of it in the middle west late in january of nineteen seventeen i started out i was on the road when the break with germany came our evening papers of february third had the digest of the president's speech to congress the next sunday morning there was the full text i went out to walk early that morning and one of the first things i saw was a lively row in front of a barber shop inquiring i found that a big swede had expressed sympathy with the kaiser and was being thrown into the street at the hotel my chambermaid the elevator boy the table waiter did not wait for me to introduce the subject everybody was talking about what the break meant war of course they were ready they said as the days went on i found that was the opinion of everybody one morning i landed at a railway junction town with no train until late afternoon it was a forlorn place at any time but deadly now with the thermometer around twenty below a friendly ticket agent warned me that the only hotel was no place for ladies and sent me off into the territory beyond the railroad shops to a dingy-looking house which he said was kept by a woman who was clean and decent it was anything but inviting on the outside but travellers who are choosers are poor sports the woman gave me a room and following the only wisdom for the lecturer who would keep herself fit i went to bed it was four o'clock in the afternoon when i came down the woman of the house whom i had found in the morning rubbing out clothes was in a fresh gingham dress sitting in the living room reading the chicago tribune beside her lay a copy of the record herald i found that this woman since the beginning of the trouble in europe had been reading full details in these admirably edited newspapers she had not been for a war she said until they went back on their word that settled it for everybody out here now she said there is nothing else to do i do not know how often i heard those words in the days that followed when the president said of america in closing his address to congress on april second nineteen seventeen god helping her she can do no other he was only expressing that which to the majority of the people of the west as i heard them had made up their minds closely watching i personally felt utterly remote there was nothing for me to do in the pandemonium of opinion nothing i could say or do would hinder or help and so i went on with my daily rounds 
i was speaking at a big dinner in cleveland early in april when a telegram was handed to me signed by the president it appointed me a member of what he called the woman's committee of the council of national defense i did not know what the appointment meant but when your government is trying to put through a war whether you approve or not i had long ago concluded that as for me i would do whatever i was asked to do and so i sent at once an acceptance of what i took as an order two weeks later i received my first instructions they came from the head of the committee dr anna h shaw End of chapter fifteen